Bible study for Sunday, the 21st of February, which is this year, the first Sunday in Lent. Now, what you'll notice throughout the lessons today is a theme that repeats itself that refers to baptism and new life and God's promises to us. And so when we start our penitential season here, uh, people outside the church think of Lent as only a season of renunciation and beating our breasts and wearing sackcloth and ashes. But both liturgically and in terms of the lessons we use, the focus is on turning away from the world and turning to God in order that we may experience new life. And so our focus in the lessons this first Sunday of Lent is very much on that, on new life. Yes, on the first Sunday of Lent, we will also pray the great litany, uh, which asks for uh, protection and deliverance. Uh, and talks about all the things that can go bad, uh, badly wrong in this world. And so there is a, a strong penitential flavor throughout Lent, but it highlights that penitence is not about just feeling bad about ourselves. Penitence is certainly not about punishing ourselves. Penitence is about turning to God. Now we start out in the ninth chapter of Genesis with the so-called Noachian or Noachitic covenant. This is the covenant that the Lord makes between Noah and his sons and all creation. This is the famous uh, covenant in which God says, I'm never going to destroy all creation again by water. And the sign of my covenant is when I place my bow in the clouds. So in other words, when we see a rainbow, <clears throat> we are reminded of God's promise. But actually what God says in Genesis is not that we'll be reminded of his promise, but that he will be reminded of his promise. Now, in one sense that's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense because we sit there and we say, well, God's perfect. God, uh, how could God ever forget anything? That's not the point being made here. When God says, I will be reminded of my covenant, He's pointing out that the bow in the cloud is a sign for all creation, a sign to us of God remembering his promises, of God always being constant in his promises. Now, like the new covenant established uh, by and through Jesus Christ, the Noachian covenant is not restricted to a particular people. This is not the covenant that we get given to the people in Exodus, the people of Israel. This is not God electing his chosen people and saying how they will relate to him. This is focused on all creation because the covenant is made not only with human beings, but with the animals who are in the ark with Noah. And so the covenant with Noah is focused on the creation of life. That offered through Jesus is, off, is focused on life everlasting. In each case, God's purpose for creation is demonstrated, blessing and life everlasting. God gives his rainbow as the sign uh, that the world shall not be destroyed by flood. In each case, in other words, God's promise is coupled with a blessing and with a sign. We can compare, when I say in each case, we can compare this covenant with the one that God establishes with Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis, where he takes Abraham out and shows him all the stars of the night and says, so shall your descendants be. In each case, there is a coupling of blessing and sign, uh, which points to God's sovereignty over all creation. That is, the promises speak to a plan to create life and that life as created is good. And we, in Lent, remind ourselves of this by turning away from all those things that would seek to alienate us from God's plan, from God's blessing. In the Psalm this week, Psalm 25 verses one through nine, 
we get uh, part of an individual hymn of lament written in the form of an acrostic in Hebrew. In other words, the first letter of each line follows the order of the Hebrew alphabet. Throughout the psalm, the major theme is the way of the Lord. And the verses we get today uh, reveal that the Lord makes his way clear to us. Uh, in teaching us his way, the Lord shows compassion upon us despite our sinfulness. Uh, the Lord pardons as a part of his own righteousness. In other words, it is in God's nature to forgive. Now here the psalmist talks about lifting up his heart to the Lord. We get that in the verses today. In contrast to Psalm 24, in which the psalmist recounts that there are those who lift up their hearts to what is false. And we're supposed to read these two together. Either you lift your heart up to what is false, whether that's fame or money or you know power or whatever it is in the world that would allure us, or we lift our hearts up to the Lord. Now in Hebrew, to lift up uh, is to identify with. In other words, who has my loyalty? Who has my attention? Who has my focus? Is it the world? Or is it God and God's will? Very Lenten theme, and in Lent we remind ourselves of all the things that we can do to seek always to focus on God. The epistle this week is from the third chapter of 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter was probably written about the year 65 in Rome at the very beginning of the great persecution under Nero. Now this was the first real persecution of Christians under Nero. Uh, there has been a scholarly debate for generations over whether or not Peter really wrote this letter. The weight of opinion is that he did. That there is a likely uh, Petrine source here uh, and that the letter was written before Peter was martyred, probably about the year 66. Now, if we go and look at a little chronology, the first gospel written chronologically, not in the order they appear in the Bible, is Mark's gospel, probably written sometime between the years 64 and 67 in Rome. And it is generally thought, going back to the first century, people have been saying this, that Mark's gospel is essentially Mark writing down what Peter tells him that Mark acts as Peter's secretary, and Peter remembers what happened when he encountered Jesus and what happened as they walked along. Then we get Peter writing his letter, knowing he's going to be killed. Uh, it's in this same persecution under Nero that St. Paul will be killed as well. So there's a lot going on. Uh, the verses that we are reading today, verses 18 through 22, we really need to read together with verses 13 through 17 because they're linked in the original, in the Greek, by a clause that means because also. Uh, unfortunately, this is even deleted from our translation. The, the verses we get are meant to justify the claim made in the preceding verses, 13 to 17, that it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Peter's point here is that when Christ suffered for doing good, his death was not the last word. And so it shall be with those who suffer for his sake. Now, from very early on, the reference in verse 19 here to Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison has been read along with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 to indicate that on Holy Saturday, between Good Friday and Easter, Jesus descended into the place of the dead. And this is the scriptural foundation for the phrase we use in the Apostles' Creed, that he descended into hell, or that he descended to the dead. Peter goes on and refers to the flood at the time of Noah to indicate that this flood was a type 
of baptism, that is prefiguring baptism. A type is something in the Old Testament that reveals something that will be fulfilled in the New Testament. Peter refers to uh, the, Noah and his sons being saved through water uh, as a type of our baptism. Elsewhere, Paul will refer to the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, passing through the waters as a type of our baptism. All of these are reflected in the baptismal liturgy that we use whenever anybody's baptized. And they're certainly reflected in the language of the great vigil of Easter. Uh, few were saved in the flood, few will be saved in the current persecution is Peter's point. And notice the reference to the small number of Noah's family. The same flood that destroyed, however, also saved a few and so it is with persecution. The church is not going to be snuffed out by the persecution under Nero. In fact, the church will go, grow stronger. As uh, St. Cyprian famously said, the uh, blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As we enter into Lent, we remind ourselves that renouncing the world, it means that we will renounce things that are otherwise attractive to us. We may not be actively suffering in renunciation, but we may be called to suffer. And if we are suffering because the world hates us for not loving the world, we need to remind ourselves that long before the world would hate us, it hated Jesus Christ. And we need to offer any suffering we undergo to Jesus, that he may lift it up, that our hearts may be lifted up, and that we in this offering may participate in Jesus' redemption of the world. Our gospel lesson is of the baptism of Jesus Christ. This is the account from Mark chapter one. And Mark is pretty spare in detail. All of the accounts of Jesus' baptism, very little bit. We have Matthew having Jesus hear his father say, you are my beloved son, but also the crowd hears it, same in Luke. In John, we don't get really an account of the baptism, we just have John saying, here's what happened when I saw the descent of the Spirit. In Mark, if you pay attention, when the father says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus hears that, the crowd does not. So there's a different take on it in Mark. Now, the voice that happens here, you are my beloved son, happens when the heavens are torn apart. In fact, the heavens are torn, the, the, the original Greek verb really refers to rending things apart as a term of violence. Something really happens. The boundary between heaven and earth are taken away. And any separation between God and humanity is healed with the coming of the sun. The boundaries between heaven and earth are taken away. This is what happens at every celebration of the Holy Eucharist. The boundary between heaven and earth are taken away. We say that in our liturgy. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we say heaven is breaking into the world. Let's participate in that new life. Now the Spirit descends here. Uh, we get various translations, dove-like, as a dove. It is an adverb in Greek. We're not talking about a physical bird here. This is a possible reference to sort of the brooding or hovering of the Spirit over the waters of creation in Genesis chapter one. The voice repeats what is said in Psalm two, verse seven, you are my beloved son, I'm well pleased with you. But the reference is also to Isaiah chapter 42, verse one, that God is well pleased with his son. The voice note does not speak of adoption, that God is somehow adopting Jesus as a human being, but of confirmation of the pre-existing status of the son. John, of course, says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is, after his baptism, immediately driven into the wilderness. That's Mark's favorite word, immediately, uthus in Greek. It's a connector. All of Mark reads like a screenplay. Enter Jesus, stage left, and immediately. 
Now, he's driven into the wilderness. And if we go back to the Old Testament, what happens in the wilderness? God shows up. Every time somebody's in the wilderness, whether it's Moses with the burning bush, whether it's Elijah in the wilderness, that's when God shows up, when all that would take us away from God is stripped away. Uh, the 40-day period that Jesus spends in the wilderness is our type for Lent. We seek to participate in Jesus' preparation for his ministry, earthly ministry, in our own Lenten devotion. The translation here refers to John being arrested, but in the original uh, Greek, the phrase is after John was handed over. And handed over is a term used by Mark also to describe Jesus's passion. This parallel usage uh, reflects very clear intention on Mark's part that the depiction of John's fate is a foreshadowing of Jesus' fate. Jesus' statement uh, is both eschatological, the time is fulfilled. The eschaton in Greek is the end times, the end of history. So the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven has come near, is what Jesus says. And so the statement is both eschatological and prefigures all that he will say in the remainder of the gospel, that the kingdom of heaven has come near to you and that we must choose it. Uh, the term Mark use for, uses for this proclamation is evangelion, in other words, gospel, good news. And this echoes the terminology used in the Greek version of Isaiah chapters 40, 41, and 52, the good news is preached to the people. Jesus is fulfilling the ancient prophecies and inaugurating a new age in creation. And may we, in gathering for Lent and in observing our Lenten disciplines, fulfill the prophecies that Jesus has given to us, that those who will come to know the Father by and through him will do so by following him. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.